So, friends, members, business friends uh, of Ukrainian Austrian Association, with this I may officially uh, may welcome you uh, to this online event. We have been silent for nearly one year. I remember it was one year ago uh, when we had uh, uh, our famous writer uh, speaking about his political, political uh, uh, pressure, pressure uh, concerning Ukraine. And uh, uh, we were hosting more than 50 people uh, at the restaurant in Kiev. But then it was coronavirus. And uh, that doesn't that mean that they were silent. silent. Some may have uh, the impression so, but uh, you may have in mind that uh, uh, at the same time I was until January this year, also General Secretary of the International Council of Business Associations and Chambers in Ukraine. And that was quite a job. We had a lot of online meetings and that certainly uh, was much adding to the awareness of Ukrainian Austrian Association, uh, which is uh, together with uh, uh, Ukrainian Austrian, where Ukrainian Austrian Association is a member, together with uh, uh, the German Ukrainian Chamber of Commerce, the British Ukrainian Chamber of Commerce, the French Ukrainian Chamber of Commerce, the Swedish Business Association, uh, the US US Ukrainian Business Council, the Canada Ukraine Chamber of Commerce, the Turkish Business Association, and the Chinese Commerce Association. Um, and last not least, and not to forget, the Ukrainian Chamber of Commerce and Industry. All those uh, members of the International Council were represented by their heads. That means chairmen, chairpeople, chairmen, chairwomen, uh, presidents, etc. So uh, we created quite some awareness of the Ukrainian Austrian Association, which is one of the quite small members, but meanwhile, I would say uh, quite uh, esteemed and regarded as compared to the size of uh, our association. Let me open this meeting to introduce uh, the host of this meeting. This is Mariana Cordun. She has been my right hand for years and the uh, right hand of the board, including my partner, my colleague in the Board of Management of Ukrainian Austrian Association, Stefan Habeck, who is also uh, viewing and, and participating in this meeting. And she has done such a good job, not only at Ukrainian Austrian Association, but also at uh, the International Council of Business Associations and Chambers, uh, where she was very much respected uh, by the heads, by the leaders of the, of the members uh, that uh, we had, Stefan Habeck and me, that we had promoted her uh, to the board of Ukrainian Austrian Association. Mariana Kordun is the host of this meeting because I don't like to deal so much with technical issues. So if, if something goes wrong, it's her to be blamed, it's not me. Good, uh, let me have a look. At the catchwords I had uh, uh, written down. So uh, since March last year, it was Corona. We have not done so many online events. So uh, as I said, it may give uh, somehow the impression that we have been silent, but it was not the case. I was speaking out not only as general secretary of the International Council, but also as president of Ukrainian Austrian Association uh, on behalf of the International Council. And uh, I think that was a, a good thing for our association. Um, as I said, we have widened the board by Mariana. Mariana is the only Ukrainian board member now. So if uh, uh, there is something in Ukrainian and also in Russian, it's her. Uh, who is assisting us, uh, Stefan Habeck and, and, and me. 
and she's also assisting me in uh, uh, business issues because uh, uh, from uh, Ukrainian Austrian Association and from the International Council and from the new Rotary Club, Kiev International Business, uh, which I have taken over to build up to charter and where I'm the charter president for uh, 2021. Uh, these are honorary jobs and they don't feed the family. So of course I'm doing uh, B2B matchmaking uh, in business uh, between mainly Austria, Ukraine and vice versa. But uh, due to my um, activity also in this international council, uh, also in other countries, mainly German speaking, for example, Germany. Good. Um, concerning the projects of uh, the Ukrainian Austrian Association, uh, Ukrainian Austrian Association is a nonprofit organization. So uh, when I'm talking about projects, I'm talking about taking over the umbrella for uh, some projects. I only want to mention one, uh, which is uh, uh, very actual because it was started uh, only some days ago. And I may show this to you. This is the IT pool, mainly from uh, the big city of Dnipro in Ukraine. Uh, in that case, for German industries. It's a project of the Ukrainian Austrian Association as an umbrella. I personally am doing it as an entrepreneur, both in Austria and in Ukraine. And it is in partnership with the Ukrainian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, because my German partner in this respect uh, is uh, the representative of the Ukrainian Chamber of Commerce and Industry in Northern Germany, uh, domiciled in Hamburg. And uh, this uh, uh, Mr. Henning Fink, he's a well-respected, well-known businessman in Germany. And he is the German uh, bridge hold of uh, uh, this initiative. If you ask why a project with Germany, umbrella, umbrellaed, so to say, by the Ukrainian Austrian Association. Uh, clear reason, of course, we are working uh, to have a bridge hand in, head in Austria as well, but this uh, has not worked so far in that we can start marketing in Austria. And uh, uh, Germany was coming in through my uh, relations in uh, Rotary world because I was addressed uh, uh, to maybe build up a project in this respect. So uh, to just give a very short overview, I don't show any other slides. Um, this is uh, five uh, and maybe even six companies. It's a pool of companies, mainly domiciled in Dnipro, which is a, a, one of the technological cities of Ukraine long-term closed city in Soviet Union because space cluster, Soviet space cluster, space industry was in Dnipro. So it was a lot of secretive, secretive, clandestine um, secret operations um, which have been done from Dnipro. And that means that in Dnipro, there are uh, a lot of technically minded, deeply rooted technically minded people, um, mathematicians, etc., which is very good for IT. And there are some other reasons. And uh, we are doing uh, this project, uh, um, as I said, in partnership with the Ukrainian Chamber of Commerce, uh, which is represented in Germany by my German business partner. And uh, there is also the general consul of Ukraine for Northern Germany, um, residing in Hamburg, who is also giving the umbrella to this initiative. This is a lot of work, but uh, uh, with uh, nearly 100,000 jobs, unfilled, a deficit of 100,000 jobs uh, in terms of IT experts in Germany, uh, there is a very, very big, large, 
potential uh, concerning uh, uh, this initiative. And uh, this is uh, taking quite a lot of my time. So I'm stopping it concerning this activity and uh, turning back to our Ukrainian Austrian Association. Uh, we do plan uh, to uh, have now on a quite regular basis online meetings. So the next meeting will be in six to eight weeks. And uh, we uh, will invite uh, one of uh, uh, the prime journalists, international journalists, uh, international and Ukrainian journalists, writers um, in, 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 in Ukraine as a guest speaker talking about uh, his views of the uh, political situation and possibly also a little bit on the economic situation in Ukraine. Um, just some words in this respect, uh, uh, since there are a lot of participants from Austria and also from Germany, as I have seen, uh, Ukraine economically, macroeconomically speaking, is doing quite well. Politically, uh, it is in a kind of limbo because on one hand, it does want, it does intend to fight corruption. It does intend to establish a rule of law, uh, including uh, property rights, um, et cetera, uh, trying to uh, fight the oligarchs where they are hindering the state uh, to perform its uh, uh, mandatory uh, duties. But when I say it's a kind of a limbo, there are still forces in Ukraine who are trying to prevent that. And you see this in parliament uh, when uh, president and when the council of ministers wants uh, to appoint a minister, sometimes the uh, at least on paper, majority party, servants of the people, uh, this is uh, President Zelensky's party, uh, does not get uh, the majority uh, in reality in parliament for some of these moves, um, appointments, uh, laws, etc. So this is a quite difficult and sometimes not so 100% clear situation. And I do hope that things will get more transparent. And I do hope that uh, uh, the forces and uh, the moves uh, to make Ukraine much more Western European, that they will prevail and they will win what is sometimes even an internal fight. So that for politics. And uh, uh, I may give now the floor to our honorary guest, to Mr. Karl, I don't say von, because von, uh, noble title, uh, does not exist in Austria anymore, to Mr. Karl Habsburg, head of the Habsburg family, grandson of the last emperor, president of Pan Europa in Austria. I still remember uh, his father, Otto Habsburg, who was president of uh, um, Pan-Europa uh, in general, and uh, which was a also a very, very highly esteemed and a very much reputed European politician. And uh, I'm happy that uh, his son, uh, Karl Habsburg, will now speak about the pan-European movement. Pan-European movement is something he will tell that, uh, which has a long history for more than 100 years. And I'm also um, happy and I'm, I'm proud to be member of the board of trustees of Pan-Europa of Karl Habsburg in Austria. And uh, I give now the floor to Karl Habsburg. He will be talking about the pan-European movement to give you an idea what it is and its significance for Ukraine. Karl, happy to have you here. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alfred, for the invitation. 
Thank you very much. Are you unmuted? Yes, I think I am unmuted. I have taken the liberty okay, of Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Good. Well, thank you, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, dear Mariana, of course, ladies first, dear Alfred, Stefan, thank you very much for um, inviting me and talk a little bit about the pan-European movement, what it really means, and of course, the significance it has uh, for the Ukraine. I will, of course, go a little bit into history and have a look on what the development meant uh, in Europe to be kind of a real pan-European and then probably uh, see if we are getting a little bit to talk about uh, Ukraine and, and, and get, try to get fast into a debate, which I think would be very good. Um, first of all, of course, what does it mean to be a pan-European? I mean, that's, that's the good question. Um, I think the answer, there are many answers to that because of course there are different principles that pan-Europeans are defending in general. But I think one thing is very important that when you ask a pan-European, what is Europe? He will mean all of Europe. And he is not just talking about the European Union, because of course, when I am traveling outside the European continent and people talk about Europe, they do not mean Europe, they mean the European Union. And I think to make this distinction of saying that pan Europe is all of Europe is something which is very important. It goes uh, beyond those borders that are currently now the European Union and uh, takes in the forefront what has been the claim of the pan-European mo movement at all time, uh, which is that it really encompasses uh, the entire continent. And of course, another problem is when we are looking back and we are looking at the development of the European community um, of European Union, and we somebody asks themselves, what, are, what, are, what was the starting point? People will almost automatically point to let's say the Schuman plan, to the European Community for Coal and Steel, to some of those elements, but at the time after the Second World War. I mean, of course, the Second World War was incredibly important as determining the foundation of what the European Community, European Union later came to. And I'll come later, um, I'll come more, I come to talk a bit more about that. But I think what is very important also for the pan European. Um, movement, European Union, is that we are looking further back and we are looking at the impact that already the First World War uh, had on this change on what we saw in the European continent and what was really creating the concept of a united Europe. And I think that definitely one of the persons that has to be mentioned is Richard Kutnow Kalergi, who was, as a consequence of the First World War, developing his European ideas. He was developing his vision of Europe because he just saw the changes uh, that Europe was taking through the First World War. And he was a real visionary when he was looking into the future and the potential development of it. But I will come to talk a little bit about that. I think um, until 1918, until the First World War, there was something like a European order. I mean, it had nothing to do with what is today the European Union, but it was basically meant as long as there were conferences where the different European powers would agree on something, it would mean that there was more or less peace and things would work out and it had a huge, big international um, impact. Uh, we should not forget that, especially in the decades uh, before the First World War, Europe was undergoing a tremendous economic boom. Um, the, it benefited tremendously from international trade, from the international division of labor. And you could really see that for the first time, you would see some sort of uh, serious globalization that was starting with certain agreements within Europe. But then in 1918, Europe was completely dismembered. The different empires were either directly dissolved as a consequence of the First World War, or the decay of this empire started, like for example, with the British Empire, which was then falling apart a little bit later. And the individual states that came from those empires uh, tried to solve their problem through isolationist policies and through protectionism, or also through nationalism. And of course, we know that has not really worked out. So um, what then were the lessons uh, of the turning point in 1918 for Richard Kudenhof Kalergi. I mean, as I said, Europe fragmented into small countries and would basically be
become, and he saw the danger of that very much, a plaything of non-European powers. He, at the time, he mentioned uh, Russia and he mentioned the United States, and he clearly analyzed that the policy of protectionism would only increase the damage for Europe. And consequently, he said, Europe must find a way to unite, as otherwise it would plunge into another other devastating war. And today, of course, we know how clear his vision was back then in, 19, in the 1920s, in the early 20s, and he knew what followed. Uh, his approach at the time was a geopolitical approach. I mean, he was concerned with redefining a European order, not in the sense of what even at the time would have been an unrealistic return to the old order, but as a structure that would re-establish Europe as a global political entity and not turn it, as I mentioned before, into a plaything of non-European powers. And therefore, his thoughts were focused first and foremost on European foreign policy, so as to not be dominators on the stage of world politics. And then next to the foreign policy, of course, something which corresponds with it, he was relating to a European security policy in order to not become dependent on others and thus dominated in this regard, or to be drawn into a new inter-European war, where again, we see the ability, the vision he had at the time. And thirdly, uh, the dismantling of all intra-European custom barriers. Today, this would be called a free internal market meaning Europe as a free trade zone. And in addition, there also was the idea of a common currency, which he was coming up with after the First World War, which in Kudnov's concept was based on the gold standard, which was still used at the time. Uh, and then of course, also one thing which I think is very important, a European federal court, which is today's European Court of Justice. I always think it is very interesting when I'm uh, traveling in areas where countries are working together uh, in a, I wouldn't say similar way, but trying to be in a similar way than the European Union. Uh, I, I'll give you the example, for example, of the ECOWAS states, the Western African states, I'm, I have quite a bit to do there. Uh, the one point that they always, the politicians always point out is that they say that the, they point out that the European Union is for them, of course, the role model, something they would like uh, to achieve, that they have a common currency, they have a collaboration on quite a high level, I mean, I, I wouldn't compare it with the European Union, but they are working on that. But the biggest importance they always point out is the European uh, Court of Justice in that existence, because that is an entity uh, that they do not have and that they are craving for. But let me go back to the, the security policy and the foreign policy, which was uh, the basis for the start of the real unification after World War II. And we have to be very clear about that when we look at the development of Europe at that time, uh, the, 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 let's say the founding fathers that were, after, that were there after the Second World War, they were having a clear vision of what Europe should be, what a united continent it should be, the dimension it should have. And it was clear for them that this Europe would need a foreign policy, a political dimension and a security dimension. But it was after, directly after the Second World War, of course, not possible to implement that uh, because of the elephant in the porcelain shop, which is Germany. So they, it was clear that with Germany, it was impossible to achieve that. There was a lot of other work that had to be done in Germany first, starting with denazification or whatever, any of these sort of things before it could be integrated into an international respected body. And that's why they decided to go to take the way that they would uh, head for the economic questions first, because they were sure that if the economic questions would work out, it would create such a common interest that the political dimension would actually uh, follow very soon um, after that. So the core, the, the, the core idea of European unification at the time was to create a common zone of uh, freedom, security, and justice. But that applied to all of Europe. And I think as pan-Europeans, it is always uh, important to say that these, these basic core values cannot only apply to the founding members of the European Union, because we can, of course, not blame anybody who was, after the Second World War, waking up on the wrong side of the Iron Curtain, uh, and therefore um, having a very difficult time, and therefore we should not 
create a, a privilege um, uh, for those countries. So the question of enlargement is of course a question that is discussed to some degree. There is a certain focus in the European Union. For my taste, of course, it is not focused. There is no, not enough focus on it, but there is a certain focus in the European Union on this question. I have to kind of um, make a little remark here. Um, there is, of course, always a debate going on in the European Union about, uh, the, let's say, the, the conflict between enlargement on one side and deepening of the institutions on the other side. And I always, it, it's, this is a conflict that completely puzzled me over the years because it was existing all of the time, because I, we need both. We cannot have just one of them. Yes, of course, there are enough problems in the European Union that we have to try and fix. But on the other side, uh, if we don't create an area of security, of freedom, of stability, then also the best economy doesn't really help be because uh, the, the basis uh, for a working economy is not given that way. And uh, so, um, of course, the, we need both. We need a deepening of the European Union, and we definitely also need the enlargement. When I'm looking at the enlargement questions, then today we see that the focus of the integration uh, is basically on the six countries in Southeastern Europe that are not yet EU members. And in its latest report uh, on enlargement, the EU Commission rightly states that the admission of Albania, Bosnia-Herzegovina, Kosovo, Macedonia, Montenegro, and Serbia to the EU is a that's, a, that's a quote from the report, a geostrategic investment in peace, security, and economic growth throughout Europe. The, the geostrategic importance of the region is clear to anyone familiar with the history. And in politics, as we know, there is no vacuum. In Europe, if Europe withdraws from the region, there will be all the more room for other powers to advance their interests in Southeast Europe. In addition to actors like uh, Russia and Turkey, who have been connected to the region and its politics throughout history, today, uh, above all, also China, but also powers like Saudi Arabia, for instance, with the different Wahhabi interests, uh, exert an, a, a, a tremendous influence in the region. And the interest of those actors do not coincide with European security policy interests. I think it's very important if we just look at the map, it becomes totally obvious that we have an area in Southeast Europe that over history always has been a bit of a trouble spot uh, and which is surrounded by countries, member countries of the European Union, which are not yet part of it. So if we want to create this area of peace and stability, of course, that does not really work without those countries. So Europe itself must formulate and defend also its own security interest by creating that stability area. When I mentioned Russia and China, is, it is clear that this is primarily a matter of geopolitical interest. And this should also be borne in mind by those EU member states that keep blocking this enlargement out of mostly petty national or even uh, nationalistic interests. And um, I think it was, I always like to uh, remind of one quote that I particularly like, uh, which is a quote that William Islam, a German a fabulous uh, writer, journalist who came from the extreme left and then in the course of his life turned more and more conservative and then ended up uh, publishing a very conservative magazine, the Zeitbühne, uh, when he always said, for interior politics, we need accountants and for foreign politics, we need statesmen. So in order to have the vision, the geostrategic vision, you need statesmen that are able to kind of implement that if you start to take the mind of an accountant and start talking about uh, geostrategic uh, elements, something else will come, will come out than somebody who has uh, the, the vision uh, in this respect. But of course, we must also look uh, to the East, talking from the perspective of the European Union, where a country like your country, like the Ukraine, uh, with the Euromaidan, uh, or the, the so-called revolution of dignity, has made it absolutely clear that its citizens see their future in Europe much rather than under Russian dominance. And undoubtedly, there still are major problems in all the countries regarding, for instance, for the rule of law and corruption, uh, but there are 
European countries, nevertheless, and that's the, the one thing which I mentioned in the beginning, it's very important when we are mentioning Europe, we mean all of Europe. Anyone who takes European unification seriously must make it possible for every European country to join the European Union. And that is why I also, of course, advocate, and I'm mentioning this here and quite often, uh, the, the upgrading of the current neighborhood policy towards Ukraine to a very concrete uh, accession uh, perspective policy, which is absolutely necessary for Ukraine. Um, I mean, I always like to point out currently, you're all watching the news and we have to listen uh, so much to uh, questions of the difficulty of colonialism and the heritage of it and things like this. But then I always like to point out also to some European friends that it is quite complicated um, on, to, on one side, uh, talk about the faults of colonialism, but then to look, for example, to certain European countries and to tell some of them you are European, you are European and to other countries you are not European. This is nothing else but a certain colonial behavior and this type of neo-colonialism of kind of um, deciding for third countries what they are, whether they are part of Europe or not. So I think the decision if a country wants to be part of Europe has to be made by that country and not by the European Union. European Union, of course, is a club and they have made the standards for entry to that club very clear. That is rather um, transparent, uh, but they cannot just go to one country and say, okay, you're you okay, I, I consider you European and to another country, no, I do not consider you European. I think this is a neo-colonialist behavior, which is really uh, not um, acceptable. Um, I just want to talk briefly if time allows that, and if Alfred allows me to talk about, take my time for that, about two fundamental principles of Europe, which I think is very important. One, of course, is the rule of, rule of law, and uh, the, the other is, uh, is freedom. I mean, uh, I, I don't know how much you are suffering by watching CNN or some of those American programs, and currently there was a lot of talk of rule of law. I always like to remember that the development of rule of law, the achievement to kind of create rule of law as a basis is a very, very European achievement. And actually to have something as rule of law, meaning that everybody in a country is submitted to what law really affects is a European achievement. I mean, it definitely has its roots still in the Middle Ages. For me, one of the very important aspects when rule of law was implemented was the Congress of Vienna, so the post-Napoleonic times, when basically all the countries were getting together. And this was one of those conferences where, let's say, European history was redrawn, the continent was established new, and one of the ideas that was implemented at the time was rule of law. Uh, it was logical because also in the Congress of Vienna, a lot of international treaties and contracts were done something that had not really existed in the same way before. I mean, for example, the treaty that was regulating um, the, the, the uh, shipment on rivers, Binnenschifffahrt, I'm sorry, I don't know what this is in English right now, uh, but so these sort of international treaties were created there. And of course there had to be a legal framework for that. And the legal framework was the creation, of, well, not the creation, but was the implementation of rule of law as a basis for uh, European politics. And I think it's just very important um, to mention this again and again, because what we hear today, and we hear this also not only in the United States, but also in Europe, is very often the primacy of the, the expression of the primacy of politics. And I think the expression of the primacy of politics is a very dangerous thing to do, um, because basically this is going away on what is the rule of law. It is the opposite to the role of law, because it basically means the, uh, means the dominance of factions and parties that are above the law. And that is absolute, or that are capable of changing the law according to their own ideas. That is something which is absolutely non-acceptable. And we have basically to work and uh, see and constantly mention and fight for that rule of law, not to let it fall into the hands of some few privileged who think that they can use it to their advantage. And of course, the other element is the element of freedom. Um, I, I have to quote Richard kudnov kalergi when it comes again, the founding, the founder of uh, Pan-Europa uh, about this idea, when he says, uh, and I'm quoting him here, the European ideal is freedom. European history is one slow struggle 
for personal, spiritual, national, and social freedom. Europe will exist for as long as it continues this fight. As soon as it abandons this ideal and becomes unfaithful to its mission, it loses its soul, its meaning, its existence. And then its historic role in history will have to come to an end. So European unification, however, European politics should not aim to bring an end to Europe's historic role, but actually to really make use of it. Uh, I would like to mention something which is a, a, a bit of a definition of this freedom, because I know it's very difficult and very complicated. I'm glad we're speaking English because, for example, in German, we only have one expression for freedom, which is Freiheit. Uh, in English, there are two different expressions which are used for that same element, which is freedom and liberty. And I think the fact create a definition between freedom and liberty is something very important to understand the, 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 difference, the difference between and to also better understand the importance of this Freiheit. Because basically what freedom means is the inner freedom, the freedom to think it is my individual freedom that I'm trying to enact. And liberty means the outside structure that is necessary that the inner, that freedom, meaning my individual rights, my individual freedom rights as an individual that I can live them, that I can enact them. It needs a structure. It needs a state structure that does not subdue me. And that is liberty. And there really somebody whom I like very much. He was a very important representative of the Austrian School of Economics. It was Murray Rothbard um, did a, a quote, which I think explains it all very short because he said, living in liberty allows each of us to fully enjoy our freedom. So in other words, only when we live in an external system of freedom, we can actually enjoy and live out our inner freedom. And liberty in English means the external construction of freedom. And that is what actually creates freedom for us while Freiheit, that freedom means the inner freedom. Um, so that of course is one of the core values. This individual freedom is one of the core values of the, uh, of, 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 should be of all of Europe, definitely of uh, the European Union and protecting freedom, protecting and creating liberty is therefore a supreme task uh, of politics. Um, it is not about sustaining and exercising power as it is so often claimed nowadays, but serving those eternal values, which is justice, freedom and benevolence. And I would like to quote my father here on this specific question of this basic concepts, where he said the three concepts, individualism, freedom, legal order, are expressions of the same deeper reality, which we can call spiritual cultural substance of Europeanism. And that basically comes back, what basically does it mean to be European and what does it mean to be a, a pan-European? Um, earlier I spoke a little bit about, or quite a bit about um, foreign and security policy, about the need for EU enlargement and about the geopolitical challenges, which are not getting smaller and the weaknesses that the EU still has in this area. But this also translates into a very specific request which I think we need for the European Union and considering that the centenary, and thank you very much, Alfred, for mentioning that the centenary is coming up uh, next year of the Pan-European Union. So I think we have definitely deserved a certain right to put up certain demands for Europe because we have been, I think, rather uh, active in uh, creating its basis. Um, it is precisely in this foreign and security policy issue that European sovereignty is needed. In this specific case, sovereignty means the ability to act and to shape. In terms of potential European policies, would here bring clear added value compared with purely nation state politi politics, policies. And to put it more precisely, the European Union needs a European foreign policy. European foreign policy does not mean coordination of the foreign policies of 27 member states by the high representatives for the common foreign and security policy, who at the same time is one of the vice presidents of the European Commission, 
and where individual countries can block a European position on important issues such as human rights policies in China, for example, as it just happened, or for example, but rather a UA foreign ministry headed by a foreign minister. And I think the last couple of weeks have shown us in a very graphic way the importance, and that's something that you probably understand much better than many Europeans understand that. And that is when we had the person who is currently the high representative for common foreign and security policy, which uh, is Mr. Borrell from Spain, when he did his abysmal, terrible visit to Russia uh, at a time when Russia just had uh, arrested Alexei Navalny after having accused of him of sneaking out of the country while he was in a coma and uh, uh, then basically withdrawing himself from reporting back to courts while he was recovering and just survived uh, the, the poisoning that the Russian state had done on one of its citizens with the help uh, of, of, of weapon grade uh, poisons that theoretically should not be developed at all anymore. And at that stage, we could see that the European high representative decided to go and visit Moscow. And he was asked by quite some of the member states, namely those that do understand what Russian policy is, namely those that are neighboring to Russia, talking about the Baltic countries, I'm talking, I mean, not neighboring, but very close, for example, Poland, that were asking him at that stage not to go and not give the Russians basically a, justific a, a, a justification of what they were doing. But he just neglected that. He went to Russia. And then there was this terrible press conference that he had together with the Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov, where during the press conference, basically Lavrov was telling him that he was expelling uh, diplomats from the European Union at that stage based as a consequence of what the European Union had been doing. And I mean, can you imagine a more um, a, a worse political slap in the face when you have a high representative there of a, of a union, of a unit, and I'm talking about the European Union in that case, that obviously Russia regards as so insignificant that they can uh, slap the foreign representative in the face uh, during a press conference um, and, and make him look like, like completely insignificant. I think this was a clear case where we have to see that the position of a European foreign minister has to become somebody who basically has the backing automatically of all of Europe and who can really work on a Euro European policy, speak with one voice for all of Europe and not go to some place where in the back of it, somebody like Lavrov knows that some countries support him and some countries are violently against what he is doing. And to this end, we need a core of a European constitution, of course, that is specifying precisely this foreign policy competence for the European Union. Uh, one point, by the way, that would also meet the requirements of subsidiarity, and I would love to go on for hours about the principle of subsidiarity as basic principles, but for uh, pan-European, this is anyway a topic they know how to deal with, and uh, they, they know about the importance of that. It must be clear to all of us that this step towards uh, a real competence is not going to be easy, and it will take a lot of convincing to actually establish a European position uh, towards um, uh, towards this comp towards this competence uh, in foreign policy, and I think this is also one point where the Pan European Union comes uh, into the game. Um, we have the conference coming up of the centenary of um, the Pan European Union. I of course hope that the new and dynamic Pan European Union of Ukraine will participate in this conference and in the work up to that conference come up with ideas and demands and, and, and uh, uh, suggestions of what can be done there. Because, because I think it is these type of conferences that is comprised of people that are passionate Europeans that are willing to look into the future and that are not necessarily bound by uh, legislation time. So they don't have to think from four years to four years. They can think longer ahead, which is something that always was the strength of the pan-European movement, that they could really come up with interesting concepts and ideas and bring these ideas into the future. We have on the other side, conferences inside the European Union, like the Conference for the Future of Europe, which was started in 2019. It was supposed to come to fruition in 2022. Of course, we don't know exactly if this is going to happen because lots of 
elements of this conference, which should bring renewed ideas and concepts to the European Union, um, was a concept that France was uh, bringing to the table. It was much more of a, uh, I would say, election stunt by President Macron because he wanted the Conference for the Future of Europe to end at the time when he would be in the middle of his election campaign for the presidency in France, which would basically then help him to regain that and show his European uh, prowess in, 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 in this respect. So I'm not expecting too much from that conference. We had a couple of those concepts in the past. They have never really completely worked out. So I I'm, I'm, have reduced hopes for that. But I think it's very important that we as Pan-Europeans still bring our ideas to the table and uh, try and see that these, those get implemented. What does that all mean now concrete for the Ukraine? Of course, one thing is we always, as Pan-Europeans, have to point out the importance that Ukraine is um, uh, part of Europe and that it's also part of a European security planning, we should not forget, and that's one thing uh, we all have to mention that you can count on pan-Europeans, I think all over Europe about that, that we do not forget what is uh, actually happening with territories of the Ukraine that are currently uh, occupied um, by uh, their Eastern neighbor uh, in a way which, I mean, it is so unspeakable that I'm sometimes really lost of words uh, in breaking every international treaty that is possible, even treaties that they have themselves brought forward, um, in breaking um, binding rulings by international courts. Everything what's happening there is just completely um, unacceptable. And of course, we, we cannot accept this, this flagrant violation of international law, of European law, and of human rights law. I mean, this just, just class disqualifies the current Russian government really to an extent that we have to think and uh, work with all measures that can be taken uh, to counteract this uh, aggression that is happening uh, on the eastern flank of Europe, which currently is held for by the Ukraine. So we do owe the Ukraine a lot that they are actually uh, holding up European uh, ideals against a neighbor like that. So of course, the demands that we are bringing up on one side is something I've mentioned before. It's the uh, neighborhood policy, that the neighborhood policy changes into an accession policy, that uh, drastic steps should be taken uh, against the violation of international law. And um, of course, you in the Ukraine know that many Western Europeans uh, do not really understand the concept of sanctions and how this works in Russia. We know that general sanctions don't work. Uh, luckily, most of the European Union has understand, un understood that. And the only thing that really works are sanctions that are undertaken against individuals that are engaged in that uh, question of the violation of international law and of neighborhood policy. And it is not enough what has just happened in respect, for example, with um, Alexei Navalny, that the sanctions were imposed on those people that had to do with the poisoning, with the arrest, uh, and with these absolutely ridiculous kangaroo courts to which he was exposed after he returned uh, to Russia. But it really has to go, these individual sanctions, A, have to go quite a couple of levels higher up for those that have the political responsibility for what's happening there, but they also definitely should go against the different oligarchs. Alfred, you have mentioned this also in your initial statement, uh, which we should not forget. Very often, these oligarchs are seen in the West as people that are kind of businessmen with quite a prowess and quite a ruthlessness that have been in the right moment, in the right place, and therefore made big fortunes, which is, of course, a picture which is completely wrong. Some of it might be right, but we should not forget that these oligarchs are basically people that are living as play as toys for the Russian president. That's why such a big percentage of their wealth actually belongs to the Russian president. And we are not talking about peanuts. We're talking about 50%. This is why it basically makes him the richest person in the world. But they are really, they are play elements for the Russian president. And so they are enablers. And as long as we don't start also to take those sanctions against the enablers of the policy which is happening there, we are not going to achieve a lot. The interesting thing is, of course, we would have a huge amount of power there 
because we should not forget that especially all these oligarchs and a lot of the politicians love to have their accounts in Switzerland and in Luxembourg for some strange reason, they consider them safer than having them at uh, certain Russian banks. They all want to send their, kids, their children to Western schools, they are to European schools, they want to have their holidays on the French Riviera or in Spain somewhere. So, I mean, what we really have to do is we have to say, these are the enablers, we have to take, I mean, the Magnitsky Act is a typical, very, very good um, element that is working in this direction. We have to take those steps against the individuals. This is what's really putting pressure on them. That's what's hurting them. Uh, general sanctions just don't work. And it's very important to kind of point that out to create an understanding also in the West for importance of that. Because very often we hear the argument, general sanctions don't work. I do agree with that. We need individual sanctions when something like this is happening. And then, of course, but there's also homework for the Ukraine. We know that, of course, rule of law, corruption that is happening there. There's a lot of homework to be done in the Ukraine, too. It's not only the European Union that has to change their neighborhood policy into the accession policy. And of course, in all of this, I would wish, I would hope that the pan-European Union is having sort of a watchdog function, harping on about these different topics pointing out where the problems are and therefore putting Ukraine where it really should be, which is at one of the central pillars of a future united Europe. So thank you very much. Carl, thank you very much for this really impressive oversight and uh, statements. Um, we have now a question and answer session and I hope you are available for maybe maximum half an hour still, because sure. there may be questions around and everybody is invited to pose these questions via the chat function at the bottom of your screen. And uh, uh, we will uh, unmute uh, those people. Uh, yeah, and uh, they can unmute themselves. But first, please tell us which are the questions and uh, uh, we will call you uh, to, to, to pose them, to ask them. I may start with a question myself. Uh, Carl, you had mentioned rightly and quite decidedly that uh, uh, Ukraine is uh, in the tension field between, call it Western Europe and Russia. Uh, forgetting that uh, at least uh, the uh, uh, important parts of Russia are also European, so are also Europe, like Ukraine is, uh, what do you think should the European Union do actively apart from giving um, a membership perspective uh, or uh, say declaring a member candidate status, what should they do uh, to assist Ukraine to withstand the pressure uh, Ukraine is taken uh, due to this uh, tension field, first. And second, you are active in Ukraine. You have radio channels in Ukraine, etc. So you know Ukrainian uh, world, Ukrainian politics, and, 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 and also business, uh, certainly more than, uh, much more than the average Austrian. And as a politician, uh, and as somebody who is uh, very active, what would you recommend Ukraine to do in order to lessen this burden or to get rid of part of this burden being a tension field between Russia and Western Europe? So from both sides, uh, as a pan-European, as a politician, and as Karl Habsburg-Lothringen. I mean, thank you very much, Alfred, that you're kind of uh, pinpointing that a lot of it, I have, I think I've already said. Um, that mean, I'll just put it together uh, again in, in, in some highlighted points. Um, I think it is, it is very important to change the uh, policy that the European Union has towards the Ukraine. Um, it, Ukraine needs a perspective that, that, is, that is completely clear. Uh, and uh, but at the same time, I think we have on one side to clear up a couple of historic nonsenses that are existing in uh, hearsay history, which is kind of rather uh, unacceptable. 
uh, and probably let me start with that. One of the arguments we always hear is, yeah, oh my God, once that the bipolar system in the world between NATO and Warsaw Pact uh, was breaking down, didn't we act uh, clearly too fast in doing an enlargement of NATO and the European Union, and this must be threatening to poor Russia, and uh, they must be, you know, they must feel encircled. I mean, everybody who is saying this is singing the song that Russia is trying to flog to us uh, through its different media outlets. It's basically sounding like a commentary from RT. Um, that's absolute nonsense, yeah? Uh, I think what we did is we were sticking to our principles, which was very important. We basically said there are, after the downfall of the Soviet Union, after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, there were quite a couple of sovereign states that developed, and we were giving these sovereign states an option, an option to participate in the way how we see society, how we see politics, how we see the economy. And basically we're giving those states the possibility either to opt for a uh, free market economy on one side, whereas the other option was, was five or 10 year plans. And these states took their decisions and acted regardingly. So it is not that the European Union was uh, aggressively enlarging or NATO was aggressively enlarging their field, they were, offering, they were offering options and sovereign states were looking at these options and choosing the options that they wanted to have. And that's, I think, one of the narratives that we have to be absolutely clear about. The, the moment that um, Ukraine had the possibility to choose, they were choosing that they would like to be part of Europe. And I'm not astonished about that when I'm looking at the different possibilities. So that's one thing which is important. So that, of course, logically comes then to the point of what we mentioned now quite often, the change uh, from neighborhood policy to accession policy. But that means, of course, also, uh, since the parameters for joining the European Union are quite clear, and I think the European Union should not spare the Ukraine also of their criticism of things that do not work. Yeah, that is something which has to be pointed out. And I don't have to go into details here about uh, rule of law, about how courts work, about things like this. You all know that. Alfred, you mentioned a couple of those elements in the beginning of your statement. So I think we have to be very clear with, with those different, uh, um, with, those, um, uh, with those guidelines that we are, with those analysis that the European Union is doing with all accession countries. There's no question about that. But then, of course, uh, on the other side, since you were also looking into the other side, it, it is, uh, there is a lot of homework to do for the Ukraine too. I'm not talking necessarily purely for the position that they are in between Russia on one side and the European Union on the other side, but also in internal politics and, and what's happening here, there's a lot of homework to do. We know that. So that, that's, that's a, that's a two-sided thing. Uh, on the other side, of course, I think it is very important to not leave out of the perspective a very pan-European aspect, which is, um, that when we are talking, and I started with that, that I said, when we are talking about Europe, we mean all of Europe. And you completely rightfully mentioned that a good chunk of Russia is also a part of Europe. And of course, if I'm trying to dream and I'm very happily looking very positive, I'm a professional optimist, I'm always looking positive into the future. Yes, I would love to see uh, Russia being at some stage part of the European Union, just not under the current preconditions that we find in Russia. They will have to undergo a tremendous decolonization um, uh, process. I mean, I'm always looking back in the history of the European Union and I found it very interesting that one of the big um, deeds that General de Gaulle was doing for the European community at the time, that he said he will not let France enter the community as long as they are burdened by different colonial policies from Algeria. And only when this was solved, France was becoming part of this, uh, was becoming part of this European community, was kind of entering into that. That was, I think, after the Second World War, one of the big steps that de Gaulle was taking. And in the same way, we should say, until Russia has done their homeworks about colonialism and things like this, uh, they cannot really be part of this European family. But yes, on the long run, of course, we always say pan-Europe is all of Europe, and that definitely encompasses um, at least parts of what is Russia today. 
So yes, the Ukraine will be a nexus in this on the long run and has to be aware of the role that it could play in the future. Thank you very much, Carl. Uh, before I'm giving the floor to Günther Fehlinger, uh, who is quite well known by several of us, um, I may add to what you say in that uh, Ukraine, in my personal opinion, has to adapt also its culture to Western Europe. It's a cultural issue. And I give you two examples. One example is most Ukrainians I know, and uh, those are certainly not the street workers, uh, the people uh, sweeping the streets and uh, uh, driving the buses. Uh, if they go to Austria, Germany, uh, UK, etc., they say, I'm going to Europe. And I always tell them, listen, you are in Europe. Ukraine is part of Europe. Oh, yes, oh, yes, oh, yes. And I have a second uh, example concerning cultural gaps, cultural dif differences. And this is leading over to Günther Fehlinger, who will uh, have uh, the floor uh, in, in one minute. That is the currency. And I think this is an issue you have raised, Günther, and this is completely right. Uh, if you talk how much is it, apart from Ukrainian Grivna, people will tell you it's so and so many dollars. So uh, without wanting to blame the United States to have a bad influence or whatever, uh, uh, Ukraine has an association agreement with the European Union and not with the US. So why don't they think in Euro? It's always dollars. If you see a foreign currency, it's dollars, never the Euro. So there are, this is just two examples Absolutely. of cultural differences. And I always say, if you want to be part of uh, uh, another unit, and in that case, to be part of a, of a unit which is stronger than uh, you are yourself, that means Ukraine wants to be European, wants to be European Union, is striving. Uh, to become a candidate, uh, at least uh, many people want that. You have to speak the language of uh, the, the one you want to be part of. And I'm not only speaking about English or German or French, I'm speaking about the language, uh, how to behave. You have to adapt your behavior, you have to adapt your culture. And this is one point I may say from uh, meanwhile 15 years of observing uh, uh, Ukrainian culture and uh, there is still a long way to go. And this is one of the prerequisites in my view uh, for Ukraine to be eligible to be part of Western Europe, to be part of European Union or whatever, or uh, still a, a road to go uh, to be part of the real pan-European movement. So this just as a remark now, uh, Günther, the floor is yours. Please unmute yourself. Okay. Thanks, Mr. President. And my question, Mr. Habsburg, is the following, because Paris- uh, Open the chat, please, uh, if you have uh, further questions. Now, um, Günther, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yeah, I have- Please speak out. Mr. Habsburg, my question is like this because Paris is bent to block Ukraine. I think they have decided to not allow a potential candidate status. So my question is, is it possible to bypass this blockade of the French with integrating Ukraine first in the European currency system with the help of Germany and Austria, but also to build an alliance with Albania, with Macedonia, with Croatia, and especially maybe you with your unique connections in the Balkans and in Ukraine, maybe you could see a personal role to form a Balkan-Ukraine alliance to bypass the French resistance. Thank you very much. Of course, you're pointing out some things which are very important at the current stage. Um, I think one thing, and, and you are very well familiar with the policies there, is that we have to be aware that the process of A, uh, changing neighborhood policy, 
to accession policy is going to, it, it's a long shot. It's not going to happen very soon. And we have to see also how uh, politics in France are developing. I think that is not necessarily something which is inherent to French politics, but it's inherent to current French politics. So I really hope that on the long run, as we see resistance from certain countries against certain members, I mean, we have this constant example, for example, with Spain uh, blocking Kosovo in every single aspect, as we can see. Um, we have to find a way how to overcome this individual resentments when they are existing. And I think that the, the Spanish resentment against Kosovo is probably a much more longer, a deeper rooted resentment than the French resentment um, against the Ukraine. So we are in a long ball game in there. And I think we, we have to prepare for that long ball game. And we should not become discouraged when certain things don't go well on the way. We know what we want to have at the end. There again, I think it's very important for pan-Europeans to think long-term and not think just in the framework of election periods or anything like this, because we can overcome those uh, uh, election periods. Um, alliance with the Balkans, I don't know whether I'm very happy with uh, this idea, um, because I think also the Balkan states have such different, have such different status um, uh, in their in their position towards accession that linking to one or the other of them, I don't think would help Ukraine a lot. I think Ukraine anyway will have to go its own way in the question of, of, of getting to the accession and becoming part of the European Union. So I, I don't think I would link myself to any of the, of the Balkan countries. Mutual support in certain topics, great. Totally agree with that. That would be a, a very good point to have a bigger communication going on. And I will very happily kind of just definitely think more about that and see what ideas might come up on the pan-European side about that. Uh, but linking ourselves to that, uh, um, I, I, I don't know. I don't have a very good feeling about that. And um, also with the, with the currency, the currency I, I just think Ukraine is such a very specific case for Europe. It is such a huge country with such incredible resources, with such a potential strength that it cannot really be compared to any other country that might be a potential accession country to the European Union. Because all the other countries are rather small countries. They don't have the potential power that the Ukraine actually have. So linking too much to them, I, I don't know. I think Ukraine will have to find its own way. The first step that we have to constantly work on, of course, is to create the European perspective for accession, because that is something that exists towards the Balkan countries, but that does not exist towards the Ukraine. And that's one point we should never stop talking about. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. There is a question from Ron Willis. If you are there, Ron Willis, please ask it. It's interesting, it's general, it's not only Ukraine related. And what you say is, uh, what you will ask, is strongly related to the examples of Bulgaria and Romania when they were uh, able and permitted to join the European <coughs> Union. Ron, floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, well, as you can read in the uh, contribution Ron. I made there, uh, I believe there are many people in the EU and including some fairly key politicians who exactly as you pointed out take the view that uh, countries like Romania and Bulgaria were admitted too soon. Uh, the membership should have been held back to pressure them to improve their situation concerning corruption. Uh, one problem is that they're both quite large countries so they have a lot of inertia it means that uh, the larger a country is, probably the harder it is to clean it up. Um, <laughs> for the European Union, uh, although those countries have been members for a long time, uh, try as the European Union may to try and force those countries to improve their situations, the progress seems to have been rather slow and rather limited. Uh, I think maybe that's one of the arguments that Mr. Macron has. Uh, so therefore, uh, that's a stumbling block, I think, that we need to get around. So therefore, uh, Carl, thank you very much for your contribution. Uh, I would like your response to that. Just before I finish, 
Uh, I thank you very much for your comments regarding the problems with Russia. And what I'd also like to throw in here is how do we make progress when we have people within the European Union uh, making it hard for us? Um, people like a particular German politician who has now become a key person in a large organization in Russia and has now just been joined by a politician from Austria. Uh, we're not being ver helped very much when we have people like that uh, within the European Union. So I'd like your comments. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Ron. Um, I mean, of course, for the last point that you made, it was, of course, an absolute disaster to say uh, that, for example, the behavior that Russia had towards Navalny uh, will have consequences, but it's not going to impact the position of Nord Stream 2. I mean, if I start a negotiation by giving away the biggest bargaining chip, then that is not boding well for a discussion that is happening in that way. Um, so that, that, is, that was definitely something which was not going very well uh, as, as a discussion point. Um, I, I want to pick with one sentence of what you said in the beginning, and I want to thank you very much for pointing out that Bulgaria is a big country. I have a lot to do there. Bulgaria always feels very small. So if anybody tells them it's a big country, that is something which is really good and raises a lot of pride there. So thank you very much for that. Um, I think the comparison, one of the big differences in comparison between Romania and Bulgaria on one side, and of course the argument that they have been integrated too soon uh, before, it was, before enough change was taking place is not really valid and is particularly not valid for, uh, for the Ukraine. If we take into consideration, not just some uh, current um, bean counting um, uh, economic elements, but if we take what was really in the beginning the idea of what a united Europe would be, which was the consequence of the Second World War to create an area of stability and security in which a good economy can actually also work successfully. And in that, I think it is incredibly important to integrate those countries with a certain leeway to integrate them because the experience that we had, and that started much earlier than Bulgaria and Romania, that started with Spain and Portugal at the time, where they said we have to bring those countries into the European community in order to integrate them into this area of, of uh, stability and security, because we know that a country, once it has become part of the European Union, com community union, it is very unlikely that it's going rogue or that it's uh, going to, 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 to radicalize is quite high. So I think uh, making a big effort of getting these countries to, be, to become a part of the European Union is something which is very important. So I really do not believe, I personally do not agree at all with those people that said that Romania and Bulgaria were brought in too early. There's always the possibility to say certain things don't work and we should have waited and we need the, the carrot and stick system in order to kind of whip them into shape before they can become members. But then on the other side, there's also our, that might be their interest, but there's also our interest. And our interest is to create this room of uh, stability and security, uh, which has led to one thing, which I always like to point out, although everyone is quite aware of that. And that is that the European Union has been the biggest and most successful peace project that this world has ever seen since written history. So we have created uh, seven, de seven decades now of a peaceful time in a continent that always had its squabbles and its wars, and it has worked as a peace project. And we want to expand on that peace project. So I think really this original idea of creating Europe is very valid. We should not let it ruled out by some economic aspects which are in it, which are important. I don't neglect this at all. But I refuse to say because of some uh, smaller, minor points that are purely there for bean counters, we should uh, forget about the security and stability side uh, and not bind these countries in. So I think if we go back to the roots, we have to vote definitely for the fact, we have to work for the fact to bind these countries into the European Union as fast as possible. Very good, thank you. Thank you very much, Carl. Let me give, uh, let me tell you a quote uh, from uh, an Eastern German, Stefan Richter. Carl, you may know him, Eastern Germany. 
uh, he is telling me, Alfred, trust an Eastern German. It takes more than a generation to overcome socialist cultural impact. So that means it will take Ukraine maybe some more 20 or 30 years to, to, to really feel European uh, from this experience. I have two uh, questions uh, uh, and I will give the floor first uh, to Vasil Korotki. He is correspondent of Ukriform, Ukrinform. And uh, please uh, tell your questions, uh, ask your question, and please give a little introduction. What is the Crimean platform? Because uh, most people may not really be uh, good at that. Vasil, you want to speak? Uh, Please unmute yourself, Vasil. Unmute your microphone. Okay, so I will read out the question by Vasil. Good evening. Could you ask, please, a question on Crimea? What, Mr. Habsburg? think about the initiative Crimean platform uh, announced by the Ukrainian government, how it should be like to be effective, to be effective, and how Ukraine should regain the control of the Crimean Peninsula in his opinion. And this is Ukraine Forum correspondent Vasil Korotki. Karl. Have you got any, um, any comment? Thank, thank you. Thank that? you for the thank you for the question. I cannot comment on the details of, of Crimean platform because I don't know enough about that to kind of uh, evaluate that. But of course, the, the Crimean question is again a question where we should just absolutely never stop to point out that it is an unlawful foreign military violent occupation of a part of Ukraine that is happening there. I mean, I think we're all realistic and know that things will not happen and change on Crimea very fast, but that should definitely not stop us from being absolutely clear, making it absolutely clear that Crimea is unlawfully occupied. And um, th there, there, are many, uh, there are many elements to it. Uh, I, I think, you know, just also the way how Russia is dealing with, let's say, the Tatars uh, on Crimea, with the uh, Krim Tatars, how they are kind of uh, subduing them. There are lots of human rights questions that are involved in that, which we have to work on. Of course, yes, we are all much more focused in the two areas of the conflict between Crimea and Donbas. We are more focused on the Donbas because it's a more violent place, more things are happening there, more long uh, elements with long aspects are happening there from the shooting down of the, the Malaysian Airlines, uh, MH17, uh, by uh, Russian supported or Russian troops that was happening there to so many elements of, of, of engagement of um, Russian armed forces on Ukrainian territory. So it is, it is more in the forefront, but we should not forget about Crimea in this respect. And I think the claim always has to be there and a lot could actually be done, for example, by support of the minorities in Crimea uh, and of support of the population in Crimea. I think there is not enough done from that perspective. As Europeans, we have a little bit lost Crimea off our radar. And that's a very sad element because it is a clear uh, expression of an illegal action that has happened that has to be revoked as soon as possible. Although I'm realistic, it's not going to happen tonight or tomorrow. That's completely clear. So that is something we just have to kind of constantly point out, but I am, I apologize, I am not completely familiar with the current, uh, with, the, with the Crimean platform uh, as a uh, state organized uh, activity for Crimea, but I will definitely have a look in. Thank you very much. Um, I have uh, a last question as far as I see, and this is from Josef Graf, uh, the head of Porsche Ukraine. Uh, quite a tricky question, but please, Josef. Unmute yourself and ask the question directly. 
Alfred, thank you very much. And thank you for all your <coughs> input and reflection, Mr. Habsburg. Uh, I have a, it's not so complicated question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is about what you mentioned as one uh, basic condition. Sorry, I said tricky, not complicated. Oh, tricky, yes. <laughs> Uh, this is about the uh, crucial position of rule of law in uh, countries which should uh, become able to join uh, European, uh, pan-European conglomerate. Uh, rule of law is not one of the strengths of uh, Ukraine, definitely. Uh, and interesting is that there is certain kind of, uh, let me say, initiatives, pressure, motivation from European side to motivate the Ukrainian counterparties to start to comply with, to start to develop in this uh, direction. Uh, what we see in fact, uh, and I'm living in this country since 13 years already, is the development goes just in the other direction. So whenever there's any kind of initiative or request or even smallest signal from the United States, uh, the guys here start to cooperate immediately, proactively. When such signals come from Europe, it goes just the other way around. And this is quite disturbing. So what is the perception? What is your perception about uh, possible reasons for that? So there is no clear will or no clear movement in the direction which would be ur urgently needed. Six. Um, I, I think you, you, are, you are stating a fact, which is a complicated and sad fact. I mean, I, I know I've made a little bit the experience myself, I think, Business-wise, I'm engaged in the Ukraine also now. I was just calculating when you said it since 14 years. I mean, I'm not living there like you, but uh, I, I get a little bit of the experience on what. Sorry, frozen. It's connection of Carlo. Hopefully yes. it was Sorry. Um, so please so, repeat. You have been out. No, I, I, I don't know where I was, uh, where I was cut off. So um, it's a little bit counterintuitive the whole thing when you uh, think that Ukraine was taking a position where they made it absolutely clear that they want to be part of Europe, which was a counter um, activity to the possibility of being part of the Russian system. So there, the Europeanism was becoming very strong. And um, uh, yes, I have seen not only in the Ukraine, I have seen it also in quite some other Central and Eastern European countries that it was in the beginning of the development. We have been talking about Romania and Bulgaria before a little bit, that their interest was probably in the beginning much more directed, let's say, towards NATO, towards certain American institutions. I'm not saying NATO is an American institution, but it's an American dominated institution to some degree uh, that, um, that there was a certain thrive to go in the direction of those institutions. Um, you're stating a fact, I cannot say too much about it. What we can do is basically put up a European offer. Um, and that is probably the fact where we have not done enough through the mere fact that we have not shown the European perspective to the Ukraine. I think once we are capable of showing them the real European perspective, then also the idea of directing themselves towards uh, elements that are coming from the United States is just something which will slowly go back. I mean, it was also mentioned before in the, I, I would say in, in, in the question, when we talk about the Khrivna, where whether this is all, whether we compare it always with the US dollar or with the euro, and we tend to compare it to the US dollar, which is also wrong. But that's something which will go over time, I hope, once the real European perspective is there. Thank you very much. I may have uh, a room, and if you agree, Mr. Habsburg, Karl, uh, for answering one more question. And this Sorry. is. Uh, in my view, a, a quite important question uh, put by Michael Tatsenko, uh, my friend and uh, partner in ICPAC uh, as director of the U uh, US Ukrainian Business Council. So Michael, please unmute yourself and talk. You are an American, Ukrainian, so uh, no problem in English. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Um, actually, Ukrainian uh, living in America. Uh, my question is about the Three Seas Initiative, which is uh, predominantly the EU project. Uh, and it can be, a, I think, maybe a pan-European project because of just purely geography. Uh, it is supported uh, in the United States by uh, several uh, Congress people and senators. And I'm wondering how Ukraine can uh, be more involved in this project uh, because currently it's only for the EU members. Uh, but if you think about the Black Sea, uh, obviously Ukraine is right there. <laughs> uh, almost the entire north coast of the Black Sea is Ukraine territory. Um, so is, is there any way to participate in this somehow, maybe through the Eastern Partnership mechanism? Uh, I, I researched this issue. I cannot find so far anything that, uh, that would uh, allow Ukraine to uh, participate in some shape or form other than maybe being an observer. Uh, so I, I very much appreciate your opinion on that. Thank you. Um, th thank you very much. Just um, a moment. Uh, Michael, sorry. Please, before there is an answer, please tell which three Cs, not everybody may be aware uh, what are the other two? The Black Sea is clear for everybody. Uh, it's uh, the Black Sea, obviously, uh, the Baltic Sea, and the Adriatic Sea. Um, Michael, thank you very much for your question. I think it's a it's a it's a very interesting question, but I will have to research this a little bit more before being able of giving an, a precise answer to that. It it was not the this question was not coming my way directly. I, I, I will have to look closer into that. I mean, I would have to waffle around now if I would have to answer that, but I'd rather look closer into that. Ron, you are kind of uh, trying to contribute to that directly. Yes, not, not to this, sorry, if I can just jump in here. I'd like to go back to the point that Joseph raised about the EU not being taken so seriously as America. My contribution is that America speaks with a coordinated voice. When, when America says they will apply sanctions, they do it. And we don't get, for example, banks in America breaking the sanctions, generally, my opinion is. The trouble with Europe is I think people outside know that Europe is not so coordinated. My experience, rightly or wrongly, is there are too many players inside Europe who don't play the game when something's threatened. I think there are quite a few organizations in Europe that break sanctions. So that my contribution is, I think that that's one reason why Europe is not taken as seriously as the US when it comes to threats, if you like to say, okay? Good. So, uh, may I have a comment on that? Uh, I think one cannot agree more. Uh, the point is that even uh, talking about uh, the tension field, Ukraine between Russia and uh, uh, Western Europe or European Union, this is a classical example. On one hand, uh, there is a, a democracy of now, I think, 27 states, which have to find a common denominator and on the other side, there is a certain Mr. Putin who tells we will do it. And within 10 minutes, things are started. And European Union, and this is one of the weakness and uh, coming back to what you said, Ron, uh, they will discuss for weeks and maybe for months uh, until to reach a certain common denominator, which is a compromise and sometimes weak compromise uh, to comfort uh, every at least important member of the union. Carl, do you agree? Yeah, I mean, Alfred, you're, 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 you're absolutely right at that. So, sorry, I was just reading another question in the, in the chat, which was coming up, so. Alfred, sorry, you blanked out briefly 
on me here, or maybe I blanked out. I, I can't hear you. Uh, you blacked out. Please, now uh, I hear please you. repeat. Now I hear you. So we are at the last or last but one question. Sure. So please repeat, Carl. No, no, no. I, I thought there was a. I'm, I'm sorry. You blanked out. I didn't hear your question. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Alfred. No, I can't hear you. You're still out. Uh, Ron, could you repeat the question, please? No. Uh, could no, you I repeat your comment, please? Uh, no, Unmute you yourself, Ron. Uh, sorry, Alfred. Uh, um, I, did you not hear what I said before? Um, I, as I say, I was just I did, my... I did, but Carl did not yeah. hear. No, 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 I, I, I did agree with that, but this was a statement, it was not a question, yeah? Yeah. It was a clear statement to, with which I agree, so there's not a question. Yeah, fine, <laughs> good. Okay, thank you. Now we have to read the last question by Ivan Dubas, and I think that's what Carl was reading, you know? I have, uh, I have, just a moment. I have a last comment. Ukraine will be part of the European Danube, uh, will be part of the European Danube strategy. Yep. This is something for a certain Mr. Mr. Erhard Buzek, who is president of uh, uh, Supervisory Council of Ukrainian Austrian Association, and who yep. has apologized at six o'clock that he can't make it tonight. And he has wished us uh, utmost success and he sends his best greetings. He got me a mail on that uh, uh, two or three hours ago. Uh, Ukraine will be part of the European Danube strategy in 2021. And do you see this, Carl, as yeah. a great opportunity for closer EU as accession with the Danube region as alliance? Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm very glad about that, I have to say, because it also shows that at least a good part of the Ukraine was part of this Central Europe and therefore has been linked to the Danube area. And that there is a, quite a tradition in it. And I think that this tradition should also uh, show the way it, it is going. Um, of course, one thing I do see in the European Union is the fact that there is a certain interest that is coming together by those countries that were, let's say, the old Danube countries or were countries that were part of the uh, old Austro-Hungarian Empire, not necessarily all of them, but let's say the, the Danube countries which are attached to that. And of course, a lot of the culture that is a typical Central European culture, European culture is something you do find in the Ukraine too. That's why those strong links logically from Austria are also existing in the Ukraine, but I don't have to tell you anything about that because you know much more about that than I do. Just historically seen, it is there. Therefore, of course, I'm, I'm very happy that Ukraine is becoming part of that, particularly see, when I have to think that uh, also Russia is part uh, of, let's say, the Danube Commission of all of that and uh, playing a role that is not that, uh, that brilliant and I'm not that happy about it. So I'm very glad that Ukraine becomes part of that partnership and is playing a role there because it is historically part of that area. So thank you very much, Carl. Uh, we may call it a day. I have to honestly thank you for your time and your preparedness to speak openly and tell you uh, your thoughts, your opinions. Uh, I do hope that this was interesting for everybody participating. Uh, we as Ukrainian Austrian Association will continue that as I had mentioned uh, at the introduction in that uh, we will have uh, another online talk, another online forum, um, in six to eight weeks. And again, I may tell that we will invite uh, one uh, quite well-known uh, personality of Ukraine, uh, who is even writing in, in British newspapers, in American newspapers and media. So he's internationally recognized and uh, esteemed uh, as our speaker uh, for uh, the next uh, uh, Ukrainian Austrian Association online meeting, unfortunately, because I do feel, and this is my personal feeling, that Ukraine is now heading into the next wave 
of uh, COVID-19. And I would not rule out that uh, there has to be imposed, there will have to be imposed a strict and a really strict lockdown in uh, uh, the weeks to come. But let's hope for the best. Thank you very much for your uh, for patience. Thank you very much for your interest. Uh, you know the website of Ukrainian Austrian Association, you will find it. If there are any questions, you will find me. Just look at Facebook or look at LinkedIn. Uh, and uh, we will be happy to stay in a dialogue, uh, maybe in a multilateral dialogue and uh, uh, see you soon. And again, thank you very much. Wish you a good evening. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Very good to be there. Thank you.